It was the moment that went absolutely viral over the July 4th weekend. Hot dog eating champ Joey Chestnut is seen on tape choking out a protester in the middle of the Nathan's competition. But could he be in trouble? Trial attorney and Long Crime Network host Bob Bianchi joins the discuss. Welcome to Sidebar presented by Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. You would think that a hot dog eating contest would just be fun and games. Well, not so, because at the Nathan's famous 4th of July hot dog eating contest in Coney Island, New York, Joey Jaws Chestnut won his 15th win, 63 dogs and buns in 10 minutes. But that was only after he got into a violent altercation with a protester. In videos that were recorded the event during the contest, a masked animal rights protester wearing a Darth Vader mask and holding a sign that says exposed exposed Smithfield's Death Star, referencing Smithfield Foods that supplies the meat for Nathan's, this protester jumps on the stage and then Chestnut, without missing a beat, can be seen throwing the guy in a chokehold and tossing him to the ground. And Chestnut just keeps on eating as if nothing happened and then wins the title. Now, according to TMZ, police took three people into custody and charges are pending. But what about Chestnut? Could he be sued for this? Could he face any charges? Joining me now is former head prosecutor, trial attorney, and law and crime network host, Bob Bianchi. Bob, great to see you. Hey, great to be on the show, Jesse. Great to see you, too. Now, I mean, I could talk about the hot dog eating contest as much as well as the next person, but I do want to get a little bit into the law here. So I, I see this, right? And first, let's talk about any criminal charges. Anything here against Chestnut that you see? I mean, was he defending the competition? Was he defending himself? Do you see any criminal liability for Joey Chestnut? You know, Jesse, when I used to have to make these charging decisions as a prosecutor, I tried to use the rule of reason and not just work on technicalities. And I think citizens have gotten to the point right now where they feel like they can protest in any manner, way, shape, or form that makes them feel good without recognizing that this guy sees some, as far as he's concerned, I would imagine a maniac charging towards him with a mask on, and you don't have to even hit him literally he's in fear of his life he's getting into the the hot dog eating guy's face and the guy reacts and i used to look at those cases like well you know what you don't come in here with clean hands i have to prove a case beyond a reasonable doubt to 12 jurors that you committed a crime if i'm going to go in that route and i never like to go after the guy who initiated the encounter uh, especially if there was not serious bodily injury or excessive force and let's give the last point it's a personal one it's not necessarily a prosecutorial one any guy that can continue to eat uh 63 hot dogs while he's in the middle of throwing a chokehold you gotta have hashtag respect jesse i mean on social media he's being hailed a hero right now i mean it's pretty incredible he doesn't break a stride and he wins the competition but i mean the use of the chokehold i think that came out of left field i don't think anybody was expecting such a swift move it almost looked like he he snapped the guy's neck now luckily that didn't happen the use of that maneuver as opposed to pushing the guy away or hitting him does that affect anything well, i've had a big problem with the use of this term chokehold for a long time jesse I, I think that it's being used very loosely um in terms of it did it cut off his air supply did it cut off his blood supply uh it seems as if from the video it did none of those things so we use the term the fact that somebody puts their arm around somebody's neck and call it a chokehold is not necessarily a straight out what a chokehold is that said putting your arm around somebody's neck is obviously much more serious and could cause more serious injury than if you punch somebody in the stomach and that's why a lot of times the prosecutorial decision is driven by the level of the injury that's actually created here being none to me does not make a difference you know when you're defending yourself um you know again it gets to a point where people are getting in your face you respond because somebody happens to be a better fighter and winds up standing ending up, a lot of times they're called the defendant and the person on the ground is called the victim, despite the fact that the victim is the one who provoked the whole event in the first place. I've never been a fan of that logic. And I think there's also something to be said, but the guy kind of nudged his way in there, right? I mean, if you want to talk about physical, it wasn't as if he just stood off to the side and was yelling loudly and then put into a chokehold. 
much much different situation. Uh, if, if somebody's yelling, screaming, protesting, then physical force is not appropriate. But he's, he's moving towards him and nudging through the crowd, as you say. Now, we don't know all the facts. I mean, from what I understand, he moved very quickly towards that level where somebody would be nervous. I mean, you don't have to wait until somebody actually assaults or kills you before you respond. Now let's talk about other than criminal liability, civil liability, let's say the guy sues Joey Chestnut, says, hey, listen, I was exercising my First Amendment right to protest this. You had no right to put your hands on me. And, I, you know, I don't know what the guy's injuries are right now, if any. But what about a, a lawsuit? When you evaluate any civil lawsuit, of course, a different standard applies. It's usually by a preponderance of the evidence as opposed to proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's a little bit easier. But the bottom line is you have to find some level of intentional assault or negligence. And you get right to the most important point. When I used to practice civil law, one of the first things you say is, and I used to use this example, if you're walking across the street and you get hit by a car and you pick yourself up and dust yourself off, you go home, you have no injuries, that's not a good civil case. The liability for the person that hit you may be 100%, but you're only allowed to be compensated for that in order to make up for the injury that you sustain. However, if you're walking across the street and somebody goes to a stop sign, hits you and you break your leg or God forbid have more serious injuries, then your compensation is going to be higher. From a practical point of view, a lawyer takes a case on usually in a civil case for a percentage and a percentage is zero is zero. So a lawyer is very keenly aware of whether or not there's a significant damages in the case. That said, from a purest legal point of view, Jesse, if they just want to go forward with it, there's going to be an issue here as to whether or not he was negligent, that is the hot dog eating guy, uh, or whether or not he felt he was defending himself. I, I just don't see this kind of civil suit I would take on as a lawyer. The only way I could see a lawyer taking it on is if they want to get uh, some notoriety or some publicity. Well, if it makes it into any courtroom, there's no shortage of video evidence and eyewitness evidence to what actually transpired between the two. Bob Bianchi, thank you so much for coming out to Sidebar. Appreciate it. Always great to see you, Jesse. Thanks for joining us here on Sidebar. Make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.